everybody. Welcome back to the show. I am doing my second interview of 2023, and I am two for two with published authors. Uh, this gentleman is fellow Canadian Sean Robinson from Belleville, Ontario, and his book that he has authored is called Going Dry. Sean, how are you today? Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Matt. I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on your show. Um, it's yeah, great to get uh, started the new year. This is my first of uh, the new year, so... Rad. Excellent. So have you been, uh, yeah, have you been doing a, a bit of a podcasting tour, just going around doing some interviews, promoting the book? What does that look like for you as far as, because uh, I know in the pre-interview you'd mentioned it was around the end of September that you released this book, Going Dry. Uh, yeah. How was this? Uh, so you're about, I'd say, four months into, uh, you know, the post-release and, and getting the word out there. How has it been going for you? Um, it's been going really well. Um, it did start a little slow. I didn't know when I was going to have it released by, but uh, my uh, publisher that I'd hired to help me self-publish, she, you know, tried to push to get it out for Labor Day, early September. So once we kind of put it out, it was like go time. And yeah, I, I've uh, just tried to get a lot more. Um, I've just tried to put it out there a lot more because I don't come from a you know big following. So to get uh, to get it out there has been a bit of a slow go. But you know I've been on probably six or seven podcasts and uh, you know developed quite a Facebook presence that uh, try to promote it. It's been it's been going really well so far. Excellent. And how about uh, as far as like any uh, partnerships, collaborations? You mentioned that you have. Uh you know, some help with the publishing and such. Uh, do you have anybody that's helping you with anything else? Or are you kind of doing like the solopreneur thing? Like where you're just uh, you're taking care of everything, the marketing, the social media, you're, you're wearing a lot of hats right now. Um, the publisher uh, that I hired, they, they do a lot of um, assistance with setting me up. I can do my own marketing and um, I'm still going through that with them, but I'm doing a lot of it on my own. Uh, my brother-in-law, he's, uh, he's helping me a lot. Uh, just to get you know more an online presence, um, I'm gonna start doing some some YouTube stuff I think, and just get some more video out. Very cool. That's like an uh, something you don't think about, and I'm I'm you know I realize that as I'm going through my solopreneur experience is like the whole uh, online presence thing is like a job unto itself, right? And initially, you're like, oh yeah, I'll make a few posts, and you know you don't really necessarily think of like how man you can go down a rabbit hole with that and learning about you know, when to post and the algorithms and, you know, how to reach it's, it just turns into this whole other thing. Did you have that experience as well? Yeah. And, and just to add to that, not putting way too much out there, like not trying to drive it down people's right. throats and yeah. you know, try to try to post it subtly enough that I'm, I'm getting it out there, but that I'm not um, sharing it way too much. Like I, I definitely want to put it out there all the time, but you know, when, when my, my Facebook was my, family and friends and you know you only want to drive that home with them too much before they start unfriending and blocking and whatever so right yeah, you know, yeah. the more the more like I've got my own uh, Facebook page for going dry and and you know the people that are there I, I know are you know people that want to see the content so I'm still trying to to post more there a bit more and share inspirational stuff just to um, you know keep that going because I know like anything I've liked and followed, you know, you, you look for that from those places. hundred percent. I know exactly what you mean. Like for, uh, for years I'd been uh, playing in a band and the, the majority of the the fan base that we'd have is like family and friends. And I got to the point where I realized I was pretty much spamming them. Like they, they're already <laughs> interested and I'm just like, Oh, we just, the... so then I'm realizing, yeah, exactly. To kind of pivot and find a, a home for your own community. Right. So, you know, that people like to your point, putting yourself yeah. in the other person's shoes and go, well, this, these people are actually, le you know, searching me out at this point. So at that point you can be a little more comfortable and have some more wiggle room. So yeah, smart advice. But yeah, you know, speaking of inspiring and be inspired, let's, I would love to just give you the open forum to tell us and, and the listeners about your story. Like what led you, what events, you know, your origin story with alcohol, <laughs> like growing up, you know, and, and what changed and, uh, you know, and then from there we can take a pause and then we'll get into like the whole book writing process itself. But yeah, open forum for you. I'd love to hear more about your story, about you. Okay. So I guess uh, like growing up, I've got two younger brothers and my parents are, are together. They, they, uh, they just were younger. Like my, I was born when my parents were 20. And um, so they, they had a social life when I was, when I was younger and it was, it was my dad's a mechanic and 
Um, he'd always have people over, they'd be working on vehicles and, you know, having drinks and the Friday night, Saturday night thing. And it was, it was an abundance around me all the time. Um, you know, I was never involved with it, but I, I got to see it. I got to see, you know, them mixing drinks and the, Hey, grabbed out a beer and, and, you know, having that environment around, um, so, you know, I, I knew how to mix a, a Ryan Coke when I was, you know, eight, 10 years old. And it was all fun and games because I knew, my brothers knew, you know, we grew up with that. It wasn't, we were going to drink it, but it was fun. You know, you're helping your dad out. But it was, it was something that set me up for an acceptance to it, that, that to have it around and, and to be involved with that. And, you know, not to say I grew up and had my kids doing that, but there was, you know, moments where, I developed a bit of a routine through what I saw them do. You know, I, I had an, uh, this was always a stock around, you know, you got through the weekend, you went, you got more and filled up and that got you through the next week. So I, I had, you know, a stock, a bar, different things. People came over, you had drinks. So, you know, a lifestyle of, of that through the years and camping, just having an abundance, I developed a lot of my own routines and habits of drinking when I was camping and drinking when I was, it was Friday and friends were over a wedding. And it got to a point where I would do it in an abundance and I would, I don't want to say hide it, but you know, if I was going, I'd always pack the cooler. My wife and I'd go out, I would bring more than I should have. And it would almost be in a, a mission to get through everything I brought. And, you know, usually everybody was you know, good hosts, the friends and stuff I had, and we would or have, and we would offer each other drinks. So if someone was offering one, maybe I would take one and I would do the same, but I would drink a lot more than I needed to. And, you know, there'd be mornings I regretted and felt terrible. And, you know, my attitude was bad. It was just not healthy for me, not healthy for my family. And so I, I got to a point where I, I needed to change. I didn't know how I felt brutal about where I was at with my weight, um, you know, everything to a point. Um, and I just decided I needed to change. I needed something. I didn't know what, but I was going to take a break. I was going to do a dry January. I was going to stop drinking for the month of January. People do it all the time. Um, so <clears throat> I was, <clears throat> excuse me, and I started the book this way, but I put it off as long as I possibly could. It was a resolution for me to to do this come January, but January 1st was, I think like this year, it was a, a Saturday or Sunday. And, you know, by the time we got that Monday off because of uh, the stat day being on the weekend. So the fourth was going to be my first day back to work after the holiday. So the fourth was going to be when I stopped drinking. I was going to start my dry January on fourth. So that was, um, Two years ago, I started, uh, decided I was going to stop. I've got the a beer can in my garage with the date on it. The last one I had, I crushed it and put it there as a memento of my last one. And in a couple of days, it's it's going to be two years. So uh, I'm excited for that. But, um, you know, what led me to that? I just felt terrible, needed to change. And that was where I started was I'm just going to do this 30 days. Yeah, that's a congratulations. So that's that's cool. You're about 48 hours away. Yeah, from two yeah. years. That's huge, man. That's so cool. And uh, I know you mentioned in uh when we were talking before we got started, uh going dry is essentially a um, you know, memoirs, if you will, or you know, uh documentation of that first year. So and that first year is so crucial, isn't it? And we can get into that, but you know, just the fact that yeah, it's it's really cool that we're capturing you, you know, at this time is like just knocking on the door at two years. That's that's an amazing thing. And you know, yeah, interesting, uh, you know, having the visual, like visual cues are so powerful. So for you to have that crushed beer can yeah, uh, is a reminder, like a trophy or whatever it may be, a memento of some kind, right, is a, is pretty interesting stuff. And, you know, a really relatable story, right? Like just the uh, exposure to alcohol when being young. And like you say, it wasn't necessarily like you know, being forced down your throat by any means. In fact, the opposite, but just the fact that you were exposed to it and uh, it was normal to you or for you uh, you know, was interesting. I think very relatable, right? I, I very much have a, a strong memory of, you know, being like five years old and, you know, being called over my dad and my uncle Paul were, were in the other room being super loud and drinking and giving me a sip of beer or whatever. And it, it's funny like, at the time. Right. But now yeah. it's like very vivid memory that I've, 
remembered all this time. Right. So yeah. Interesting stuff, man. Um, what was it like growing up in, uh, so you said a population of about 65,000, um, you know, what was it like in like your teenage years and so forth? Was there a degree of like using it as like social, like you had mentioned, you'd sort of stalk it, you'd have it around for social uh, experiences. What was like your high school life? Like specifically though, like, is that where you really started uh, dabbling into it or where was, where was the, uh, where did it kind of start turning on you? I guess is what I'm leading towards. Yeah. Um, well, when I was 15, 16, I started working at a restaurant and in town and, um, was there pretty much all through high school, had a lot of the same friends. Uh, we worked together and, <clears throat> um, after work, you know, you get done your shift restaurant closes at 11 midnight or whatever. There's nothing to do in town. Uh, you're 16, 17, 18, you can't go to the bars or anything, or at least you weren't supposed to be. Um, but yeah. uh, you go out to somebody's house after, right? And, and yeah. you know, there was times we were, you know, some parents didn't really, not that they didn't care, but they knew if you were here and you were here for the night and there was a couple, it wasn't so bad. But, uh, you know, I get into doing that every weekend and, you know, it definitely set set me up for for that. Once I started to get you know, 18, 19, 19 Ontario, we're able to, to legally drink and, and yeah, we're going out to the bars and almost pre-drinking ahead of time at someone's house or at work. It was, you know, teenager kid stuff and, you know, go out to the bars every Thursday to Sunday and feel miserable the next morning, but you're a kid and you brush it off and you do it all over again. Yeah. Um, I had that routine every weekend. You, drinking with the same people uh you're going out every night it was college loans and whatever you just um yeah i did it it added up for sure but that that was and 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 really that was where it set it up for me that i felt like i chased that because that was the most fun i think i had when i was drinking is when i was you know young and and had all these friends and every you knew everybody at the bars and you know, and then it got to a point where, you know, I wasn't doing that anymore, but you remember how much fun you, you might've had with that buzz and that moment. So I was chasing that. I felt yeah. for every time I went out, it's like, Oh, I need to, we're here late because of whatever delay. And I need to drink a lot more quickly to get that buzz back. Like I remembered having when yeah. I was younger and I didn't find it because I didn't slow down. I would drink uh, at the same pace all night, even if I was trying to just have a couple quick ones to to get to that buzz, I wouldn't slow the pace down. I kept going at the same pace and then, you know, it would be time to go and try and find a way to, you know, throw back a couple more and then, then it'd be time to go. And, and, you know, I was feeling miserable and would lose the whole next day or so. Yeah. Right. Right. I, um, and one thing I can relate to too, is like the whole camping experience. I remember the first time I had Cause it was like camping and, and drinking were just like hand in hand. I, I hadn't had a sober camping trip until man, probably like thir when I turned 30, like when I first sobered up the first time. And, and I just remember sitting there just going, man, this is like so boring. We just sit here and like <laughs> stare at the trees and you have a fire. Like it's, so, I'm like, ah, usually like, I was like you, I think you said something along the line to paraphrase you. Like it was like a, a mission to get through like a flat of beer. That was like my like to-do list for the evening, right? Yeah. Maybe start a fire later, but this is what I got on <laughs> tap. I'm going to get through these 24 beers, right? Or try to anyways. Um, yeah. What was that like for you? Cause like, I, I, I can relate, you know, we're both being, you know, Canadian Canadian boys I'm sure the great outdoors is a big part of both of our upbringings and such so what what was that like for you initially like redefining what camping was was did you have that same kind of experience yeah. like oh is this it like <laughs> oh yeah that and I, I found that with 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 a lot of things not just camping but but I would go camping and I would bring because you know you don't want to have to go back out or you don't want to leave on the Saturday to go get right. more so you'd yeah. bring that extra case or so so that you didn't have to. Well, that was more problematic because I didn't have to worry about it because I knew there was another case in the back of the truck. Right. And and I would just get through what I had in the cooler. And then, oh, if I run out of that, well, I got these other, you know, vodka, sugar, vodka, juice things that I can yeah. throw in between to, you know, break it up a bit. Or I've got this bottle of rye in the back of the cooler. Like there was just an abundance. And yeah, it was like a mission. It was like, this is what I was going to do whether we were playing games, sitting around the fire, it was, it was everything to have just one drink after another. 
you know, if there was something going on, I could do it as long as I could do it one handed. <laughs> oh, I haven't heard it worded like that. That's that's funny, man. So to uh, not do that, it, it was because yeah. uh, my my wife and our family, we we bought a cottage together and it was it was then, you know, that routine similar at the cottage. But um, to not do that it was a lot of, and what I wrote about, about the habitual part of, of drinking for me was, it was because every time I went and do, did these functions, you know, I felt like I had to be a certain way, or I had to do it one handed, because I had a drink in the other hand, it was <clears throat> more pressure and more awkward for me to do it without the drink, mm -hmm. more because it's what I was used to, than it was the other way. So to, to go camping and not have it, um, and then, then really to start the journey for me, I didn't want to take that break from drinking and then go automatically to the zero percents and the, the near beers and those things, because I didn't want my routine and habit to continue after the January was up or, you know, I, I can talk about that after, but I didn't want after whatever I decided my break was going to be in the beginning, I didn't want to do it on zero percent beer. I didn't want to do it on feeling like I didn't change the mechanism mm. so to go camping and, and to bring you know water or what i was doing was i, I bought a, a yeti mug right mm -hmm. i just bought one of these mugs and i'd pre-mix my drink as if it was a, a rye and coke or whatever but i'd put you know ice and i'd put some soda water and gatorade or soda water and bio steel whatever mm. and just mix it that way so that it felt like i was still playing the game yeah but i wasn't so to, to, in the beginning, just to kind of get away from that habit and that mechanism was to still have something I was sipping on, but to make a point that it wasn't, it didn't feel like it was alcohol. Like I could tell it was something different, but yeah. to anyone around me and to my own mentality in that moment with whoever it was I was with, I just needed it to feel like I was still playing the game. Gotcha. Gotcha. Whereas like, so there's uh like the, distinction or the point of differentiation between having the zero beer like it still would just it would perhaps have the same too too close to the same taste and the the, the beer logo and such was that is that just too close versus like you having the yeti mug is that sort of the idea for for me it was like yeah now like you you see somebody drinking a zero percent they're very there's a, a lot of them out now more so, so than, yeah. than the year when i started yeah um, which is good but you know you can tell you can tell when it's not um, a normal Bud Light or whatever someone's drinking. Yeah. Um, and people don't really care, but you also notice like, oh, what's that one? Thinking it's something cool and new. Yeah. Um, but I, I just, it tasted the same. I didn't, I didn't want, because I didn't know what I was, what I was doing in the beginning. I just knew I needed to change some things. I knew I needed something to change. I didn't want to just continue on the path I was headed down by having the same thing, even though it didn't say Budweiser on the can, it said whatever. I just didn't want that taste to make me feel like I, oh, I, I made it a week, two weeks, because dry January, people will commit to it and give up after a week or two. Yeah. <clears throat> or at least I've seen around me. Um, yeah. You know, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want that to be this way for me this time. I wanted to stick it out. So yeah. January, and when I got through January, I, I thought like, I, I didn't think 30 days was enough. Mm. So I, I, you know, 30 days was my commitment. I was going to take this break, but then, you know what, like I, I started to feel better. I started to feel like I was happier because my kids or my daughter was just a couple months old when I started. Mm -hmm. um, and she's two, just over two now. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you know, my two boys are, they're seven and nine now. So I had three young kids and I was noticing that I was, I had a lot more energy. I was, I was happier. I was less irritable. I just, so after 30 days, like I didn't, I didn't want to go back and I've dry February. So I thought oh, I'm going to do this for another 30 days. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to, pardon me. So then yeah, when I got through and I started listening to more podcasts and, and audiobooks, and, you know, I come from construction. I'm, I've been on a fire department for almost 20 years, volunteer and like that tough, tough guy mentality that, mm. that like, we're not talking about these things. We're not, <coughs> pardon me, we're not sharing, you know, the beyond recovery podcast. We're not talking about these things because it's just not out there. Mm. And, and 
I found listening to more things, I learned a lot more about habits and routines and, you know, 30 days, 60 days, 100 days. So when I got through February, I thought, I'm going to do this for 100 days. I'm going to continue. <coughs> Pardon me. Speaking of water, hey, good thing it's around. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. All good. Um, so I started to learn about how 100 days was kind of the, the thing. It was more a lifestyle change. I was going to get through 100 days. And that put me about mid you know, mid to late March, sorry, I guess April. Mm -hmm. And when I made it through hundred days, I had already seen anybody else around me that was doing dry January, dry February. They had all trailed off like mm -hmm. early on. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, I can't believe you're still doing this. Like you made it. Why, like, why are you not doing this anymore? And what, what had started as a break, it was going to be 30 days, whatever. You know, I didn't feel like it was enough. I wasn't ready to go back. I was enjoying how much healthier I felt, how much, how much more energy I had, the relationships that I was creating better with my kids and my wife. And it just wasn't, I wasn't ready for that to go back where it was. Um, so, and then I, at that point I'd committed to, you know, I'm going to do this for the year. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> so once I get through the hundred days, I'm like, how cool would it be if I could just do this for an entire year? Yeah. You know, I'll never, at that point, I felt like there's never going to be a time in my life where I'm just going to be able to not do this for this long. <coughs> wow. So, um, but the 100 days became became the year. So 2021, yeah. I was going to just stop drinking altogether. Very cool. Very cool. When, <laughs> when out of this, uh, you know, the, so 100 days becomes a year. And then the year becomes the idea for the book or was like, wh when did the book, the genesis of the idea of the book start forming? Was that after that hundred days or was that what, you know, when did that come up for you? So <clears throat> that was kind of in the background and I didn't know it yet, but that was in the background the whole time. When I felt awful at the end of 2020, I had felt like I tried a few things. I would, I would tell you at that time, I tried everything. I didn't try anything. But I bet you that would have been my attitude. I started journaling. I thought, you know, I haven't done this before. This isn't the macho thing, but I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm just going to do this. And and I wrote a few things down. I basically just beat myself up in there. You know, why can't I figure this out? You know what to do. This can't be this hard. And like, I, was, I was not very nice to, to myself in it, but it gave me mm. somewhere to outlet. It gave me somewhere to, to write these things down that, I wasn't going to hear about it. I wasn't going to feel the judgment. And, you know, if I wanted to just light it on fire later, you know, I could do that and nobody would know the things I was feeling. So I started journaling at the end of 2020. Once I got into 2021 and I was doing these 30 days, I maintained this journal. I, I, I kind of wrote out my progress. I wrote out things that did and didn't work or, you know, things that I was feeling. And, and I, I created these rules for myself. Mm. Um, that I would kind of use as a backbone for what I felt like I was trying to achieve mm. and, you know, rules like, uh, I wasn't going to drink, but I, I still wanted to, to be involved. So, you know, I, I kind of made it a, a point that I was going to try to still be involved. That didn't mean go to the bar every night, but that meant, you know, if someone, if there was a gathering, you know, I was going to try to be there and, and I was going to, whether I used my Yeti mug or something else. So just wasn't going to, you know, be the guy with a bottle of water in the corner that I've seen at functions, just not participating. You, you're drinking, you're feeling that they're judgment, you're, they're yeah. judging everything. Like, I didn't want to be that guy, but I didn't want to be sitting at home by myself either. So, you know, one of my rules, I just wanted to be, you know, be involved and, and <clears throat> I wanted to have fun. Like I wanted to, you know, I, I was feeling like I needed a couple beer at one point in my life to, to loosen up. Well, that's only in my own head, right? Other people around me don't know that, that I've had, I've had two beers. So now I'm, I'm good. You know, that I felt that cause I made that up based on, you know, life experience and just what I was led to believe. So two beers for me to loosen up. I didn't need it. People don't need that. It's just, you know, so I, I wanted to have a good time and, and it was important to me to try and, and do that. So through journaling, <clears throat> I kind of set these rules up for myself. I kind of, and then by about, you know, uh, September, October of that, what was that year, 
um and a guy at work he we were out and he'd asked me he's like you know how, how's it going i'm like oh man i can write a book i was like and he's like and i kind of like wow like i i could write a book like it was <laughs> i had all this, i have all this journaling and and all these things these experiences and and i mean i was in one of my uh, good buddies weddings that year and it was you know he was in my wedding years before and and we drank a lot at my wedding and you know we drank a lot together over the years so to have that relationship and now i'm going to be in his wedding and it was delayed because of covid mm. but then once he was able to have it you know i wasn't going to be the way we were at my wedding i wasn't going to be the way we were at other functions and you know we would have these wedding functions and you know bachelor parties and bridal shower things and excuse me we would every every time we went to a function you better be fucking drinking at my wedding every yeah. time and it yeah. it was heavy on me like it was cuz i didn't know in the moment what I was doing that I was going to take the year off or just be off it altogether, which is right. where I'm at now, two years and I'm not planning on going back. Um, like he didn't know. Cause I didn't know. So like he had to learn how to, how to handle it, but to tell me at every function, you know, we're getting fitted for our suits and uh, you better fucking drink at my wedding. It's like, it was, it was heavy. Cause I used to be, you know, the biggest participant and I was the one buying, you know, as many rounds and, doing shots and you know it was it was different because I had to change everything about who I was in that moment and I kept hearing you know you'd better be this way at my wedding it's like well I, I don't want to be I'm not ready to be yeah so journaling and getting through about October and deciding like this isn't unique this isn't something that a lot of people aren't dealing with and you know if I can share what you know, attitude I might have had or, you know, whatever um, I used to get through some certain moments or, you know, to put this version to someone like my old self that could use, could use it. Um, I didn't want to sit on it. You know, I, I decided I was going to start, you know, because I wanted to do this for the whole year. So getting through the end of 2021, I, I started to change the way I was writing it so that it was less editing, I guess. Cause I, it wasn't about for me anymore. Mm. It was, it was how I was going to share, you know, how this year went for my old self. That's very cool. I like, um, you know, I, know, I, I hear that a lot with, with different people that have had, uh, whether it's blogs or um, whether they start podcasts or write books, whatever it be. It's like, it's almost uh, creating something that their old, ver the older version of themselves, like you would have li loved to have come across this book, right? Is sort of the idea. And in, in fact, it was like, I love how it's like, it, it's sort of an accumulation of all the different journaling that you had done, you know, and uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I want to, I do want to get into the actual, like, creation process of the book but yeah you know it, it, i think that's a, a big motivator for somebody when there's that shift where it's like an outward sort of service-based goal as far as like trying to reach somebody and re, you know normalize it or just make them feel like they're not alone or however it may be it takes mm -hmm. on this whole different shape doesn't it yeah it it wasn't and and sorry back to listening to you know audiobooks and podcasts and stuff I, I found a lot of the the guests of the the shows I was listening to or a lot of the content was written by you know professionals so and so and doctors such and such and right you know there, there's a lot of a lot of time for that content but it wasn't what I needed the most I don't think I don't mm. think I needed the science behind it as much as I needed yeah. the experience yeah. behind it and to to try and put it out it wasn't because, you know, and, and a lot of it helped keep me accountable too, right? Like writing about it and then writing it to, to put it into a book format and working on it. Like there was a lot for me there too, to, to maintain the situation. Like when I got through the year, it was like, and I, I write about this in, in the book, kind of in the conclusion or, or the afterward, it was like, you know, now what, like, what do I do? I made it a year. Like, do I like, dry January again we'll do that again but it was like um trying to, to figure out where to go from there once 
you know, the, the book itself was the core of it was written. And once that experience and that 365 days was up, it's like trying to decide where, where I'm going to go with it now. Well, creating it and deciding to share it the way that I have was like the next version. It was like, this is going to help me continue and try to give back to that person that was me just a year before. Yeah, that makes sense. That's super cool. I guess I, that goes into my very next question. And it's like, so now you're, you know, a couple of days removed from your two year uh, book's been out for four months. Um, so what is next? What's now? Are you asking yourself that again? You know, it's New Year's, <laughs> like we're two days into the year. I, I imagine as most people do, uh, there's some point of reflection on the previous year, that being 2022. Have you asked yourself that? And what have, what have you answered as far as like, what are you, what are you doing now? What are, what's, uh, what's your plans? I think, uh, I think now just, I I just want to share this, this more to get it out there while, you know, the year is, is this fresh, like, cause there's a lot of, of, you know, and, and and myself included, um, there's a lot of, of reflection. There's a lot of, you know, using the January one as the great restart. And, and I just, uh, you know, in the beginning, just want to try and, and get the message out there that at the time to get started, and I've seen this, this isn't me writing it, but like the best time to get started was yesterday and the next best time is today. Yeah. And yeah. I just think by putting out, you know, this version and, and talking about it, and like I said, I want to try to get into some, some YouTube or some short videos to just speak towards the content of the book. But, you know, for that encouragement, there's a lot of you know, coming from, like I said, coming from construction, I'm an electrician and coming from, you know, the fire department atmosphere and, and the macho attitude, there's a lot of like, you know, you, you, the guys aren't talking about it. I wasn't talking about it. So to just put it out there that, you know, people are going through this stuff and, and someone else can relate to that. Cause I feel like sharing it now, um, you know, I've had a lot of people since this came out that, that I wouldn't have thought would listen to it because it was like I wouldn't so you know for people that and I get messages all the time where it's like you know keep it up you don't even know who's watching but keep it up yeah so I think to answer the question I just want to you know do what I can to keep myself going that I can you know keep that person that I don't know is watching going yeah that's a good answer that's a great answer I love that yeah but I think I I want to circle back because it we've touched on it a couple of times uh, during the interview, just like podcasts and such and resources that you would use. What are some of uh, your favorite ones? And I totally relate to what you say, by the way, as far as like, you know, I love that Huberman lab podcast. It's what it does for like, because a lot of people do like to have that science-based reasoning why they won't drink. I was the yeah. same way as you though. I was a lot more into like the more experiential hearing my story and somebody else's and uh, you know, having that like connection of like, oh, wow, okay, I'm I'm not alone here, right? And having that sort of empathetic connection versus the scientific, well, you shouldn't drink because what it does to your, you know, the, you know what I mean? Going off, yeah. the, don't get me wrong, that's like interesting, but that's so, for me, it was so secondary. So, but, um, you know, and like you say, there's like the Dr. Gabber Mate, like there's a ton of time for people like him, but at the same token, there's uh, a ton of time for, you know, folks like <clears> you and myself that we just, this has been our lives, right? We have this experiential you know, connection with that, uh, that's that perhaps some of these other uh, prof- health professionals don't, right? They've, it's like the difference between living something and, and learning about it academically, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the question is like, what, what were some of your, uh, your favorite podcasts or books uh, that you were, that helped you uh, through your journey as far as like quit, quit literature I, and so forth? I think in the beginning, um, I didn't, I didn't realize the extent of, of the problem that I was, that I was going through and, and, you know, so I didn't want to listen to anything really. Interesting. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, I don't want to say I felt like I knew everything, but mm. I just, I was, you know, trying to hide behind this, this personality that was, was construction macho and you don't talk about it. And, and I'm going to journal to myself and nobody's going to know about it. Um, so to listen to things, I wasn't really asking people what was out there. So to try and find something when, when your algorithms aren't pointing that way, I didn't know what was out there. So I found, um, I found school of greatness. I found mm. Lewis house. Um, yep. and, and the thing with him at that moment was there was a lot of people that I knew 
that he'd had for guests, you know, Kobe Bryant and Terry Crews and Kevin Hart. And there was, I found myself in the beginning looking for any of those shows through him or through Ed Milet. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, I started listening to Sean Stevenson um, and his, his podcast and, and um, with the doctor, uh, the doctor's pharmacy. Mm -hmm. um, so I would listen to those in the beginning. It was because I could find people that I knew, right. but once I got into, into them, you know, and, and hearing the experience from the people that I could relate to, then I wanted to listen to the Andrew Huberman's and the Gabber Mate's and the, and, and figure out a little bit more of the science behind it. It was, it was more relatable for me in the beginning to, to feel in the moment and then to find out why or mm -hmm. to get maybe a more expert opinion or, or, you know, listen to the audiobook. I found I was listening to, and I, I know that this is a lot of the reason, like you, you hear about this and you relate to what they're interviewing about. And then it's like, you know what, like I can, I could use that. So I, I, I listened to Mel Robbins, uh, uh, five second yeah. rule. And yeah, so and it was one of the first audio books I got. And I, you know, some people would think like, that's more for like a, a female it's, it's, she's a female. And, and in the beginning, I was like, you know what, like, this sounds like something that would work. This sounds like this mm -hmm. will get me off my ass. <laughs> right. And, you know, five second rule, I actually used that a bit in the beginning. I did it for three seconds. I found I just couldn't count from five, but you know, three, two, one, go. Like it, it worked yeah. for me. There was a lot of content that I was finding um, that just gave me the backup to keep going or gave me the information to, to try different things. Um, but yeah, audiobooks, um, Mel Robbins, uh, yeah, Lewis Howes, both of both of his, the, the mask of masculinity was was huge for me it was uh you know almost to the point where men can talk about it and the different ways that we hide behind you know these masks and and it was it was a it was a great book for for someone like me that was looking for you know it to be the the, the approval that it was okay to be vulnerable or that it was okay to share you know these things because we're all dealing with it in a, in a different way you know similar and different way um Atomic Habits and the Power of Habit, two two books that I uh, related to a lot um, on habit. I both read I both read them and listened to them. Mm -hmm. um, my work I have got about a forty five minute commute each way, so um, I've got lots of time, and I, I look forward to the drive now because different yeah podcasts um, uh, and the and really like being on your show and, and a few others like I've, i'm listening to a lot of of these podcasts i listen to quite a few of uh, beyond recovery i've listened to you know quite a few um uh, school of hard, uh, hard knocks talks like different yeah. versions and you're getting a lot of different um levels of you know what people are going through and and, and there's a lot of a lot of stuff there's a lot more i'm learning just hearing everybody else's version yeah, very cool. I mean, yeah, the Mel Robbins is uh, the, her books are amazing. That five second rule is, yeah, I highly recommend that. Ed Milet, a lot of a lot of what you're saying is, uh, yeah, I, I resonate with all that. And thanks for thanks for listening for uh, Beyond Recovery as well. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, the Mel, you know what? It's it's coming up as a, a topic, uh, and I, I want to I want to just riff on it a little bit here. Just the whole idea of like the masculinity, and I have a lot of friends that are in the trades as well you know, and uh, yeah, just the whole idea is like somewhere along the line, I think the whole idea of like masculine um, sort of lost its way or it's just perhaps not lost its way, but it's it's in a state of trans transition feels like as far as, um, you know, what's um, expected of, of a man and, and what's uh, and dissolving some of these uh, these old archetypes. And, you know, there's like, I, I've been exposed to a lot of different men's groups and heart circles and such over the last couple of years. And I'm just curious, like, you know, if you're still doing that work in the, you know, the trades and such, how has that changed for you? Like, have you been able to have, like, have the nature of like your relationships and conversations in specifically in your place of employment and the, the, the work that you do, has that changed at all? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and has you coming out and being comfortable with that side of it, has that changed other people? Um, I think, I think it has, like it, it, sorry, it definitely has, um, a lot for me in the beginning was being okay with not 
having that drink um, um, in my hand, not, you know, because construction, you, it seems for the most part, you're coming in Mondays to talk about how drunk you got on the weekend. Right. And you do that week in, week out, like clockwork. And it was, you know, to, to then not be that person and, and to have my own things I was doing or to be there and not feel like crap the next day because I, you know, still wanted to be involved. I didn't want to lose the friends I had. Um, but uh, once I started being more firm with, with myself being different and okay with how I was handling myself in that same moment, um, I was finding that I was bringing that out in, in other people. You know, if someone else didn't want to drink, it wasn't like they were the only one that wasn't doing it. They had somebody else not doing it or, well, Sean's not going to do it. So, you know, I, maybe I'm not going to do it. He, yeah. he, he's not doing it and people are okay with it now. I cannot do it now. Like a lot of it is just because that's what everybody else is doing in the room or that's what everyone else is doing. So 100%, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to be that way. Cause I guess I have to be that way. But once other people aren't that way, once you know about it, that's when, you know, you start to feel a lot more comfortable. So once I was more comfortable with it, I felt that there was people around me that were more comfortable with, with it, either to not give me the same hazing and shit that I would get from the guys around me. Right. Which happened a lot in the beginning. Sure. sure. Like I had to, I had to learn that I was changing, but everyone else had to learn how I was changing and had to, had to adapt to it too. Right. 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 When I was the, the last one up every, every night we were drinking, um, you know, I was still didn't trust my friends and wasn't going to be last one up, but there was, there was a time where like, you know, I was the last one up because I was the most involved and then now I'm not going to do that anymore. And when people had to learn to be okay with that. So once I developed the confidence to do that and other people were coming around with me, I felt like, um, sorry, I guess I'm back up. Like I had people that I used to work with. In, um, in construction that that would reach out and say like this is awesome this is great like I, I I'm, I'm feeling inspired by what you're doing here and, and keep it they're telling me to keep it up and you know hearing from some people that that I work with that that were you know maybe going through the same version or, or just needed to see some support um, definitely helped me feel like what I was doing was working yeah that's yeah inspiring stuff man and that's like yeah that's what it's all about and just getting through that initial you know just circle back to you know earlier in the interview that initial like relearning how to do things that awkwardity feeling it out yourself and then as soon as you're more comfortable with it it's like permission for other people that were just waiting for because yeah like you say generally if a room is going to have a bunch of people doing one thing you know the people that are sort of on the fence are generally going to gravitate towards that behavior whereas if there's somebody that's super comfortable doing it there's all of a sudden this option right even if it's just that yeah. one person so <laughs> there's a really great quote i forget who said it but it's like you know the courage of one is a majority or the courage of one can be a majority which mm -hmm. is yeah pretty pretty cool so it sounds like similar to some of the experiences that you're having which is great mm -hmm. yeah you know as we uh, wind it down i still want to talk a little bit about the actual like writing process uh so you mentioned it's like i get the impression that it was a lot of the the journals that you had done um how much of that was sort of unfiltered just put into this book is it essentially just like um uh sectioned off as like journal entries or did you like sort of you know filter it and what make it a little more cohesive or what is the actual like writing process of going dry what was it like for you so when i when i started journaling and and it was, it was for me, right? Like it there was no like, you know, punctuation and context. It was a lot of just mental dump. Um, yeah. especially when I was as, as lost and as confused as I was in the beginning, say end of 2020, it was just brain dump. And like I said, it was just a place for me to just say the things that I can't say to anybody around me. Like I have great support system, but these were just things that were heavy and, I didn't know how I was going to answer the questions that might've come up from that content, you know, yeah. people that aren't feeling the way I was feeling. And I know this is common, no matter what people are going through, but you, people don't feel what you're feeling. They're not going to ask the right questions. They're not going to give you the right advice, right? You just, you don't need them to answer. You just need to get it out. So to put this stuff down there, I wrote in the journal and, and as I wrote through it, it, it was, it was a lot of just me dumping down thoughts and, mm. 
and kind of things that that work. So when I decided I was going to write it, it it took me a bit to take what I had done and 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 all this brain dump and just put it into a format that almost was a timeline. Mm. You know, it was was taking me from that that confused point to that person at a year with 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 a celebration in mind and not sure how to do it because it, like, I wasn't I was going to go do shots because I made it a year like I was just <laughs> right you know yeah how do you celebrate that so I, I put that kind of in the book like I don't know what to do now but so to put it from the journal there was a lot of you know cleanup that I had to do to take it from what it was to you know something that someone would would want to read and, and understand so um, I found that I was I was digging a bit more to to write about the emotion that I was feeling whereas I didn't always write that for myself because I felt it right so right to put to put the more emotion in there to put more context as to where things were and, and how you know things around me were to make it more understandable for the for the reader um the beginning the first uh the intro I I actually have basically copied and pasted from my journal to you know give context to where my mind was going into it mm. so you know I start with uh you know a lot of how I was feeling at that point and and how confused I was and you know what do I have to do and then yeah just once I cleaned it up and and made it made it through through the year and you know put it all together I touched on you know a lot more of my childhood in between um to give some context as to why I felt like I had to have a fully stocked fridge all the time and you know, why I, I it, the way I was, my habits and routines were around drinking were as, as bad as they were. And I mean, there, there were times that, because whatever the new drink of the month was, or the summer drink, like I was mixing mixed drinks with other mixed drinks. And, it, you know, I, if I didn't know I had a problem then, like, there, you know, to look back on it, there was definitely moments that were adding up to it being bigger than it was. And, um, you know, writing about these things and and taking that journal, putting it into a format that I could, you know, make readable for someone else. Um, it was basically just a lot of cleaning up at that point at the end of last year or 2021. How long did it take you? Uh, was it some, like, did you take a bit of time off work or did you do like <laughs> two weeks of just uh, you know eight hours a day on this? Or was it just like a couple hours when you had a chance in the evening? Um, this was because I've got three young kids, right? And then yeah, and yeah. all the, the things with them and um, with work, I didn't take time off work. So this was, you know, evenings, yeah. weekends, whatever I could do to to finish putting it together at the end of 2021. You know, I had Christmas holidays, Christmas break. So there was kind of some time in there where I was off work a bit when the kids would go to bed that I could, you know, get through it. And then when, once I found someone that uh, I could work with to help me like, edit it and publish it, get it cleaned up, um, you know, there was there was kind of some downtime for me because once I had the manuscript done and I had it submitted and, you know, they had a chance to go through it, then there wasn't a lot for me to do in the background while you know they were working through the edits and you know even when i when i got it back to do my you know all my approvals of the edits and you know change a few things elaborate in a few things you know it wasn't a ton because of the size of this book like i wanted to keep it on the smaller side because my old self like i i think i wrote i read 28 books this just this last year wow um, yeah Nice. I, I didn't do that before, right? So for someone like my old self, it couldn't be a massive book because I wouldn't read it. Yeah. So I wanted to keep it small. I wanted to keep it focused. So <clears throat> it didn't take me a lot of editing because the content, I lived the content. So right, right. it was easy for me to, to correct what it was I was trying to say or to elaborate on what it was that I was writing about. Um, more so than a research novel yeah it totally makes sense that's cool yeah it gives some good insight about how it came together for you so thanks for that you know i just want to give you a chance to uh wrap things up here as far as like where can we find you online uh where can we buy the book uh just where can we find going dry and uh if somebody were to reach out to you if you know if something you said resonated and they want to uh, you know get a hold of you where's the easiest way to get a hold of you 
Um, so I've got um, my website, seanrobinson.ca. It basically will link to Amazon. The book's available on Amazon if you want to buy that. Um, I have uh, a contact me section on the website as well that will reach me directly. So if anyone wants to, to reach out, ask me some questions about what I went through, if I can help in any way, um, feel free to reach out. Um, Email is on my website. I've got a Facebook page that's uh, going dry on Facebook. And uh, I try to share just uh, inspirational stuff, uh, try to come up with some of my own uh, plugs about things that uh, that I kind of went through. Um, I said I'm going to try to start doing some short videos to, to just talk up the content a bit and just try to get some, some motivation out there. I found there was a lot more um, garbage on Facebook and the internet that I uh, just want to be the other side. I want to try and help out a bit. Very cool. Sean Robinson, author of Going Dry. Thanks for coming on the show today. Always great to talk to a fellow Canadian. Uh, any final words, any final, uh, you know, uh, totally put you on the spot, final this quote or uh, sound bite that you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap things up? I think the hardest thing for me was thinking about the big picture and by breaking it down into small pieces, it made it that much easier. So I think uh, if anybody wants to work on something, they got to do small pieces, small steps, and you can do it. Brilliant. Thanks so much for coming on, Sean. Great to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Matt. Thanks.